so I went back to Dorset again just a few weeks after my first visit to see Bob the dealer. He does a bit of dealing on the side. He's not a pro dealer. He's moving that way as time goes on. He's always done a bit of dealing. And it was great to have a bit more time this time to shop. And if you want to get in contact with Bob, you can email him at this address on the screen. And he doesn't have a website yet that is coming. As I said in my previous video on this, you can't visit this dealership except by invitation and that's unlikely unless Bob knows you so you know don't don't ask do send an email of what you want anything you see in this video is for sale so lots of lovely things to feast your eyes on but there's a heck of a lot here and it's all in fantastic condition most of Bob's stuff I would grade from excellent up to very fine or mint and there is absolutely loads and loads of it I'm just going to pick out a few things to show you which I think of interest and which are good as you see here, we have two Michael Marshall Smiths. So there are some duplicates, there's two Pratchett's there. So there's all kinds of things. And there's some very uncommon things. It's mostly SF, but there's the odd associational title like that Peter Straub, a very rare DG Compton there, which you never see. I've got one of those happen for years. And yeah, very beautiful stuff, lots and lots of it. Um, important reference books, that's a really good one to have. That gets quoted all the time by other dealers. For example, I think Andy Richards of Cold Tenage quotes that one a lot. Good reference book. And there's lots of recent and fairly recent ish hardcovers here. There's an uncommon Silverberg. Got my eye on that one. Pet by Charles Grant, great horror novel. So as you see, all sorts of things across the genres, if you're interested. And as I say, I had more time this time to look. And while I was doing this, this was after I'd, I'd done some shopping and Jules Burt was with me. Now do check out Jules Burt's video because it is superb. It's one of his best because he and Bob did an audio interview and talked about some bits of a I love this title, The Ulcer Culture by Kenneth Bulmer. Great title. Such a sucker for a good title. And as I say, there's a great audio interview on Jules's video, which you should have a look at. And they talk about some ephemera, which I looked at with Bob last time. But I really wanted to focus on my shop this time. So um, do watch Jules's video. It's launched exactly the same time as this one. There'll be a link in the description to this. I love the jacket of that Eric Brown. I've always found Eric quite a minor writer, enjoyable, but nothing earth shattering. But um, I do like that jacket. He's got about four copies of that. So maybe I'll pick one off, up off him one day. Here's a book which I raved about recently on my channel. First edition of, of Wreath of Stars by Bob Shaw, fantastic SF novel, one of Shaw's best. There's a nice copy of Farmer's Magic Labyrinth there, which you see a lot of, but really in good nick. There's an anomaly there with One Day, that's a very, very strange one to have there, but there you go. Great range of reference books as well. Well, as you can see, I'm here at Bob's again and doing some shopping and looking at some of the lovely stuff he's got. So I'll show you the book haul when I get home. And I'm with Jules today, so we'll get him in in a moment. In fact, let's go and see where he is now, because he's probably around the corner. Let's have a look. Where is the great man? There he is. You all right up there? Hello, mate. <laughs> you caught me up a ladder. Yeah. <laughs> check, check, checking pan stock. The, um, the so, way back by Vincent Bro. Yes, yeah, so oh, a very okay. nice colour. But a cover by Taylor, one yeah. I haven't got. So. Lovely. Excellent. So are we having a good time? Yeah, there's a lot we to are? see here. It's good. quality stuff. It is quality very, stuff. Very, very And this so. is the thing. And I mean, I've just picked up a load of stuff and Bob put some things aside from what I noticed last time. But of course, the trouble is, is when you take more time, because I was a bit rushed last time, you see so much more. And um, I was going to get some hardcovers tonight. I bought a few hardcovers from him. But look at what he's got. There's lots of hardcovers I could go for, but I'm actually seeing more paperbacks I need to pick up today because a lot of his hardcovers are recent. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I am trying to keep a focus now on my classic period between 1970 and about 1990 and looking at gap filling and what have you. And I've done a bit of that today. There's got lots of lovely stuff. Here's a great looking book by Paul de Filippo from Golden Griffin and Paul... Um, 
I know Paul online and we both contributed to Deep Ends and he said to me keep writing Steve and <laughs> I'm not really writing very much these days that's the trouble but yeah it's really beautiful stuff so I'll just see what else I can show you so as you can see there's all sorts of gorgeous stuff here Hooli is a nostalgia thing now. I'm going to show you some old McDonald's. Um, when I say old McDonald, let me turn this down because we might have copyright problems otherwise. Right, okay. I'll turn that down, Jules, because the copyright thing could be a pain. Here's something you don't see very often. Some McDonald's hardcovers of Piers Anthony Zant series. They're not my sort of thing, but they really do take me back because I used to sell loads of these in A format back in the 80s. And they're really beautiful. And they're the sort of things that if I was buying, doing nostalgia buying purely, I would pick these up because they are uncommon. So if you're an Anthony fan, um, get in touch with Bob. And as usual, as I say, you can't actually come and shop here in the way that I'm doing the jewels is doing but just send the great man an email i'll show you some other things he has here something that i was thinking about but he's somebody who has never really done it for me and it's the really early books i like is kim stanley robinson so there you go there's a first of red mars and also of green mars and he's got a blue mars here as well somewhere i've seen it because um this isn't always in order sometimes Authors are in different places. So there you go. So that's another look around at Bob Stash. So hope you've enjoyed that and you'll see my book haul at the end of the video. So I guess the next shot will be of us in the pub, I suppose. <laughs> so as you see in the classic Outlaw bookseller tradition, we're in the pub, we're in the pub with Bob. We've um, bought some books, we've had a great time you'll see a lot on Jules's video where he does an interview with Bob I was too excited I just shocked you see because that's me that's the way I work I go my own first time then I get him to drive me part of the way then later on and then while he's doing all his pro stuff I'm just goofing off and thinking, oh, I'll have that, I'll have that, I like that, what have you. I did get a so, few books, though. You did get I a few. Yeah, well, it would be very strange if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a nice set? Oh, fantastic. We've had a fantastic set. loved it, yeah. Bob's yeah. collection and his, just his stock is absolutely, you just don't see that level, that quality yeah, of, um, of book these days. And oh. um, yes, there was an awful lot of SF, but we don't mind that. But oh, some more that. general books as well, vintage paperbacks. Absolutely. Some mint file copies of the Badger books, weren't they? Which yeah, yeah. Uh, were fantastic. So I've filled in a few books, uh, a few books off my list. Um, got some penguins, some pans, digits, badgers, and I'm really happy. Really, yeah. really happy with it. It was great. Um, yeah, I could have come back and uh, spent another few hours there, to be honest. Well, if that we, will happen. If we had the time. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Um, so thanks to, to both the guys today for another fantastic day. Um, after this, you'll see the book haul, as we laughingly say. But for now, time for more beer. Cheers. Book haul time. I've just done one of those things that I know Moido was does on me did Death Cult, where he checks the camera to make sure it's filming because he said before he's sort of done like 20 minutes and then realised he hasn't put the button on. And what I'm finding with this camera is that you put it on and it goes into into sort of time lapse mode instead of just a video. Why isn't video the first choice? It's ridiculous. I mean, who does time lapse all the time? Anyway, here we are. We're going to do it now. Um, I'm a bit warm, actually. As you can see, I've had a haircut. So I'll just divest this a little bit. I know I've had a haircut. Of course, what will happen is the weather's really nice out today. It's very sunny. But now I've had a haircut, then I have shave, and then it'll get warm. That's the mystical way in which things happen. So we're doing the book haul. I showed you this during it, this little sort of children's novel by David Jarrow, which is nice, laminated boards. Hutchinson, interesting, because I didn't realise they did any kids SF that late into the 80s, but 88. And I got some issues of New Worlds, and I'm going to show you these in depth at some point, because this was got Boyness Dog by Alison in it, 
because of course some of you have asked about the history of new worlds and i thought i'd do something about that and talk about that because it is quite interesting and you can you can look it up yourself but it's an opportunity for me to sort of stretch my mental muscles on it and to show you different sort of variants i'm not going to go down the route of collecting new worlds in a big way i bought these few iconic issues because they're some of my favorite covers and my plan is actually to frame them at some point but the real issue at the moment is where am I going to put the books I've bought? Because I've got rid of a lot this week. Um, I took 15 or 16 paperbacks and gave to my friend Nick, who appears um, slightly off camera in a couple of things. There's a really short video where he does a haul. There's another one where he does a haul up with um, of Graham's house, you know, the other grumpy old man. And I gave him some stuff, things where I'd upgraded and what have you. And I also took some stuff and sold it today. So it's been another 15 books. I've got about 30 books this week. I've got another little pie and give to charity. And I've got some stuff which I need to eBay. I've taken pictures. I just haven't got around to listing it. So when it's up, I'll let you know. Because there's some interesting things going on there. I've upgraded, including some unusual stuff. Anyway, that will come. So the actual haul... If you look um, at Jules' channel, Jules Burt, do look at Jules' video. It's absolutely fantastic. It's launched at the same time as this one. And I have to say, it's one of his best videos. I think it's superb. Because what happened, the first time I went along to Bob's, he and I looked at some of Ephemera and we traded stories on SF and SF collecting and it was great. And basically, I think I must have said to Bob, you know, put that stuff aside and let, um, let Jules see it when he comes. And Jules has filmed that he did an audio interview with Bob, which you can hear, and they go through that bit of ephemera, and it's really, really great. And for me, the second time, I didn't spend a lot of time filming because I really wanted a shop. And again, we were on a slightly longer time clock, but because of, of trains, it's still an issue. So I am hoping to go at some point in the late spring or early summer again and have a proper day with Bob and, and, and chat again and do some more shopping and what have you and hopefully at some point I'll get to film his collection which is superb so anyway the book haul without further ado we're going to do hardcovers first we normally do paperbacks first I thought I'd change up a bit today and um, this is what I got first of all um, Tom of Bedlam by Mr. Silverberg, of course. This is a Golang's hardcover. This is a review copy. Um, there's the little slip in there. So obviously went up for review at some point, if you can see that. And I come across these. People selling on the review copies has been a thing in the book trade for, you know, a very, very long time. And interestingly, the jacket of this doesn't quite fit. Do you notice that? You notice the jacket doesn't fit? And I suspect that this might be a proof jacket that was printed to go on any proof copies that went out. And they had them left in the office because they printed flat, of course, and they wrapped it round this. And you know, it wasn't actually finished at the time because the whole thing about a proof is it goes out in advance. And this thing about ARC, advanced reading copy, that's recent terminology. I mean, it does say that in a lot of proofs, but in the book trade, nobody calls them ARCs. Nobody experienced calls them ARCs. We call them proofs. We always, always have going about 60s, 70s, probably before that. So proof copies, you know, is something that... You know, publishers, they send them out, they give them to the sales team. They want the sales team to read them and get excited. They want book sales to get excited. Usually it's stuff that nobody's ever going to want to read a proof copy. And I've only kept two proofs in my life. And, you know, if you get 20 in the post from a publisher across a week and a half in a bookshop, most of them, you know, you, you don't go near. It's usually dull stuff. So the books everybody really wants in proof advanced copies are much harder to get. You've got to get in there quickly. So there you go. But that's Tom of Bedlam. And I'm looking forward to that. I am building up my later Silverberg collection. So that was nice to add that because there's a, that's got a lot of horrible liveries in different parts of the world. So I quite like that. Something which I read a long time ago when it was first published back in 1988 was Le Vendis by Robert Holstock. I had a trade paperback of this at the time and I enjoyed it. It's a big book. It was a little bit too Celtic, a little bit too Matter of Britain, a little bit too Alan Garner for me the first time around. But I wanted to read it again because I'm working on my sort of middle period Holstock collection, which has moved forward by leaps and bounds since I started the channel. Got all the early stuff in first, got it all signed, what have you met him several times over the years and this takes me back to when this came out I talked to him on the phone and we'd met briefly at the Worldcon the year before that and I wanted to get him down to do a bookshop event in Bath and my idea was to get you know one or two really sort of popular famous people and do a panel like you'd have at a convention 
and a couple of lesser known writers. And the people I wanted to get were Ian Banks, Terry Pratchett, and Robert Holstock, and I think Gary Kilworth probably as well. And maybe maybe Christopher Priest. And you know, the Banksy and Pratchett were the big draws. But it never really came off. And um, Robert was keen, but it never came off, which is a shame. I never hosted him at an event, which I wish I had. And it's it's an enormous shame. But I last saw him in 2006 at the Friends and Family showing of the Prestige, the time, the film, which is based on the Christopher Priest novel. And he was a lovely guy and he died only a few years after that. And I spent a lot of time talking to his partner then. She's a charming woman. And, you know, when Robert passed on, he was really, really sad. And he was, I think, about 62 or something. And a heck of a nice guy, you know, and, and a real one-off, a great writer. Occasionally... The prose has rough edges and it's a little bit crude and rushed. But, you know, there's really nobody like him. You know, he's one of the great fantasy writers. So important stuff. So I'm really pleased to get that because that's uncommon. And I'd spotted that the first time I went down to Bob's. And I asked him to put it aside for me. So if you want anything that you've seen in the videos or anything you're interested in, just send Bob an email. He will get a website up and running, but it's not at the moment. So just send him an email because he's got loads of stuff there, as you could see, you know, tons and tons. And he might just have what you want and he'll have it at a reasonable price and in good nick as well. He's a great guy. So what else did I get? This was an impulse. Um, this is Where by Kit Reed from 2015 in Tor. And Kit Reed, I've read short stories, but I've never read a novel by her. She's quite well known for her short stories. And this has got what you call a deckled edge. If I put it face on, you can see that the text block, it's all rough. The pages are different sizes. And some people call this an American cut, but it's not that, it's a deckled edge. Something I'm gonna do soon is a video about terminology and what the correct terminology is in SF and in the book trade for all sorts of things like fart formats and what have you. And, you know, I hear these terms like duology and, you know, they're all completely wrong. We've got a language in the book world already. It's just that people are not aware of it. It doesn't need replacing by conflated made up words by people who've just come into it as Johnny come lately so we're late to the party. Leave it to the pros. Yeah, I'm getting you know, a bit pedantic about it, but that's the way it is. There is language and it's beautiful. Let's use it correctly. So I'll come on to that. So that's where, and this is about somebody arranging to meet somebody in a place called Craven Island and everybody just disappears. And I love that idea. I used to think if ever I wrote a great English catastrophe novel that, you know, you've got to explain why the place is denuded of people. And that's where the pleasure begins when it's empty. And uh, that's what really attracts people, these narratives. Uh, and I thought, well, why can't they just disappear? That's very Ballardian, but Kit Reed's done it. I'm sure other people have done it as well. So there you go. So I'm looking forward to that. And this is a very handsome book. I need to do some work on this. It has some sticker residue on the cover. Um, it's got some foxing, which I can't do much about. There's a tiny split in the jacket. I've already fixed that from behind and I need to polish it up. And um, this is a, a book which, this is the fourth copy I've had of this. I had a really battered A format, I had a nicer A format, I had a horrible trade which I got rid of and this is really really handsome. This is the first edition Putnam USA, The Unreasoning Mask by Philip Jose Farmer. Isn't that handsome? Really great stuff. This is a late period farmer. Um, I say late, it's not that late, he lived a good while after this. This is 1981 but it's probably his best late singleton I would say I would argue that way and I think the critical consensus is very much on my side with that I'm just going to pop it here on the podium for you to enjoy and fundamentally as this singleton and it, it's in its tone and its seriousness now see it reminds me of the early stories which are collected in strange relations the Freudian ones the visceral mind ones the mind body ones and it's about a character who I believe is, is he's a Muslim, he's Islamic, or certainly from the Middle East, and he's on a living spaceship. And there's a heck of a lot to it. If you like a good space opera, you'll love this. But it's also got characteristic farmer flair and verb and high strangeness, you know, which we love about Phil, the high weirdness. Because he did a lot of routine work. This is one of his non-routine books, and I know David Pringle put it in science fiction, 100 best books, novel since 1948 um, and that's not the exact title it's, it's I think it's science fiction 100 best novels and also um, Barry N. Marsberg's a big fan of this as well and um, this is a great book and I haven't read it for years so I'm looking forward to rereading it and I've always wanted a hardcover and I got this for much less than the sort of regular internet cover price I know Andy at Cold Tonnage had one 
he had it on for 20 quid and I think it went pretty quickly because he had a farmer collection in recently and a lot of it's gone already and farmers prices are going up especially in good condition and of course he had a huge oeuvre very interesting stuff some of it routine some of it taboo breaking and you know an erotic and strange and you've got these the wall newton sequence with this video about the channel which is fantastic but yeah i was really chuffed with that that's a great one somebody who i've been in two minds about for a while and i used to think he was really great and then about a year ago on the channel i think it's in the very first collector's diary and i need to do one of those as i'm done one for a while i usually do one once a month and i don't think i've done one this year anyway i bought a nebler award winners and there was a late story in that by Fritz Lieber and um, this is the best of Fritz Lieber in Sidgwick which as you can see is really beautiful it's got a little cat's paw and a big cat's paw I should say smashing a spaceship absolutely fantastic I love these Sidgwick books beautiful and the thing was was that I read this story and I didn't think a lot of it and I said so in that video and it made me reassess my feelings about Lieber because it's been a long time since I'd read any and then when I did this haul, I bought a Lieber paperback, a book which I used to have and I read a long time ago. In fact, I think it was the first Lieber I ever read. And I picked it up for nostalgia reasons and I started reading it on the train back and it was just so good. So I'm going to look at this. These stories go up to about 76. There was no, another best of a few years later when he was guest of honour at the Royal Con in Brighton, which I think was 79 and yeah but i love these i'd have picked this up anyway because these cedric books usually they're in a total state but this one is absolutely gorgeous so i'm not going to argue with that that's a real boot anthologies as you know i've been on an anthologies kit for a while it's eased off a little now it has eased off a little now but this one i couldn't resist and this is a very important one for me i'll tell you why i did have a copy of this in paperback and i've passed that on to my friend nick and at the moment space is a real issue here i got rid of about 30 paperbacks this week i sold some today i gave some to my friend nick i'm going to give some to charity about another 15 or so and i've got some things lined up for ebay um, which i just i've taken photographs i just need to sit down and list them this weekend and stop being lazy and get them shifted some interesting stuff so i'll let you know when they're up and I'll pop a link in the community page. You can see what I've got on sale. And fundamentally, this is, as I say, a really important one for me because this is new writings in SF15 in Dennis Dobson. Dobson did um, most, I'm not sure when they started. I don't know if they did one for number one. I think they did all of them. I must check the bibliography, but they certainly did the ones in the teens. And then obviously they were paper back by Corgi all the way through. Then with number 21, the hardcover thing flipped over to Sidgwick. And that's about the point where E.J. Ted Carnell, Edward John Carnell, died suddenly. And he, of course, had been the original editor of New Worlds before that, before Moorcock was. And he'd started new writings in SF as a thing. And then Kenneth Bulmer took over, um, author of The Ulcer Culture, as you saw earlier in the video. And this is a really important one for me. In terms of the quality of the writers in here, I think this is probably the very best issue of this because technically it's a magazine, it's in book form. Um, but, you know, you look who's in it. Joseph Green, author of Gold the Man, very interesting book. Um, Christopher Priest, who, as you know, is a big favourite of mine. Michael G. Coney, who I like a lot. Arthur Sellings, a British writer who died. Um, I think this issue is dedicated to him um let's see yeah it's got in here in memoriam there's a little box arthur Sellings, british sf author 1921 to 1968 so he was only 47 he did some interesting books in the 60s and we will talk about him again so that's that's a very very interesting one. It's keith roberts who i love as you know and vincent king very interesting flavorsome writer who was also a visual artist and next time graham and i do two grumpy old men we'll be talking about vincent king amongst other things this is important because in here is a short story called the interrogator by christopher priest if you watch the priest um, interview on the channel and part two is coming it's my fault which i will get around to it it's it's all on me i'm going to interview him and adam roberts it's just that i've sort of been behind the things chris will explain how he sold a story to ej carnell and then tried to sell a sequel and carnell wasn't having it so he meshed them together 
added some material and got his first novel in Doctrinaire out of it. So this is really interesting. So, so I passed my paperback of this on. There's a gap for me to put something in over there, which is good. So at some point when I see Chris, I must get him to sign this for me. I'm hoping to see him in May, but we'll see how it goes. There's like a lot going on in May and we're not sure about dates and things yet. So that's new writings in SF15. And I do like these. I like the sort of plainness of them. And um, Dobson books, they're often very sort of cheap looking and simple. You find them in good nick and there's a kind of austere beauty about them. Now, speaking of austere beauty, we move on to the sheer bliss of the Golanx Yellow Jacket. And I know this drives Walter, um, one of our regular sort of viewers and subscribers. Hi, Walter. Completely mad because he, he has real issues with Golanx, and, uh, which I can understand at times. But I love these yellow jackets. And this is The Road to Corley by Richard Cowper, or Richard Cooper, as it's pronounced properly. And this is the first in his White Bird of Kinship trilogy. It's a strange thing because technically it's a four book thing, though the first part is a short story, a novella, I should say, called The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. And we know that comes from, yeah, you're probably thinking Pink Floyd, but I'm thinking where it comes from before that. It comes from, it's not Winnie the Pooh, it's The Wind in the Willows. It's a wonderful chapter where the, the little animal characters encounter Pan, the god of panic, playing a flute out in the, in the woods. I think he's playing the flute or the pan pipes. It's years since I've read it. And I'm looking for a decent copy. I can't find a hardcover copy I like. It's not that it's out of print. There's loads of editions. But I can't find one with the sort of illustrations I want. So we'll see. Maybe I'll go second hand. But this is great. And this is very sort of Keith Roberts, Christopher Priest, um, Thousand Years From Now. And it's got a experiment in the present day which is linking to the minds of people in the future and it's very gentle um, and it's really well written and as I think I've said before my only thing with, with Cooper is that sometimes he isn't as powerful as I want him to be but this is good and I'm hoping to pick up the other ones. I'm aiming not quite for completion on my hardcovers but I am trying to go for it but some of them are really hard to find so but very beautiful I'm very pleased with that and most copies of this you see around are book club editions. You don't often see the old Golax Yellow Jackets. So I'm chuffed with that. Somebody who died relatively recently within the last year. Um, interesting writer. Not usually my sort of thing. He's sort of fairly sort of traditional SF motifs. Quite colourful. And this one I think is quite farmer-esque. I haven't read it for years. I do have a paperback of it. I read it when it first came out, which was mid to late 80s. And he's a British writer who I think is living actually in New Zealand and that's Philip Mann and this is the Eye of the Queen. Aliens, um, you know, interesting aliens, all sorts of stuff like that, all the sort of typical sort of pulp motifs that you know and love. Um, first contact, you know, communication, interpretation, that sort of stuff, quite ornate and colourful and there you go. And again, not an uncommon book, but not a common one either. So very pleased to have that. And at some point soon, I think I'll do a video about my Yellow Jackets collection because I do love them. And it's and it's really building up the last few years. I'm gradually acquiring more and more and more. And I do love their austere beauty. And they're, they're just great. So paperbacks, what have we got? Well, I got some things here, which we'll run through. But very quickly, we'll take a look. I did some upgrades. I have a complete run of what we call New Worlds Quarterly, which is when New Worlds became an A-format paperback. The first eight of them published by Sphere, the last two by Corgi. And they didn't retain the original numbers from the volume. They went to sort of to number one and what have you. And uh, This is number five. Um, and I've read these. I've had them for years, but I upgraded. And this is still in the bag, as you see, because mine had a very, very faded spine and a very rippled spine. So that's that one there. It's great stuff in here. Dish, Clute, Sladek, DM Thomas, Charles Platt. There's also Poetry in Here by Robert Calvert from Hawkwind. Great writer, fantastic lyrical gift, the finest science fiction songwriter there's probably ever been. Possible exception of David Bowie of The Stranglers, but Calvert really sort of nailed it, I would say. And uh, the last two, this is New Worlds 9 and New Worlds 10. And these were these very, very strange ink covers. I've never been sure whether I like this art or not. I've grown to love it over the years and I've had these for years in a total state and I've passed up my friend Nick and um, he'll appreciate them to read them but these are lovely and they're very minty and rippled and broken spine. The colour of the paper is good so that's great. So there's a few upgrades there and I say I'll show you the lot when we do the New Worlds magazine feature, feature talking about the history of New Worlds so that'll be an interesting thing to do. 
I was really, 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 really pleased with this. This is a book I used to have. I don't know why I got rid of it. It must have gone in a cull, probably when I was having my doubts about this writer, which I, I have done occasionally, but I've sort of reconciled myself with him with him now. Um, and this is the Robert Shackley Omnibus. There you go. And this is a penguin from 8485. And it's absolutely gorgeous. That cover, I don't know if it's coming up in the in the picture there, but this is so shiny and new. Absolutely beautiful. It's actually got remainder stripe on the bottom. If you see like a pen mark, it means it's a remainder. And I do remember it being remaindered. And this is a great collection that it's got lovely type. Oh, it's just bliss to look through. Absolute bliss. And it's got Immortality Inc., the full length novel is in there, which is filmed as Free Jack. Um, and in the 90s, and absolutely gorgeous. And there was an earlier edition of this. They did one with a black cover, which had the Invisible Man on there. And I always think that's um, Frankenstein's creature. I'm not sure what you think, but that's what I think. Um, lovely. I mean, I haven't been that pleased with an A-format paperback in a long time. Let's just say that. So I'm going to put it in private place. Absolutely beautiful. I used to have my doubts about Shackley early on because he would go off a tangents, never come back clearly sort of display that he was bored with where the story was going and and what have you and but you know the quality of his writing was always good but i'm reconciled to that now and i see it as part of this unique charm but i'm so pleased to get that absolutely beautiful so robert silverberg we always like to talk about bob here and um, bob is one of the greats and i picked up some uncommon silverberg collections here um short stories which um i have I, one of them I'd never seen before. I knew it was out there, but never seen it. And these are US ones. And this is a Valentine. Let's look at the date. Let's see. This is from 1969. And this is Dimension 13. Look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. Not um, because he did an anthology called New Dimensions, which he used to edit. And that's quite uncommon and hard to get in the UK. And Gollags did some of them in hardcovers. They go for big money. And this is absolutely gorgeous. And yeah, the paper's brown, but it's very clean and absolutely lovely. So that's good. Because I do like my bob, as you know. Here's a really unusual. I'd never seen this before. And this is absolutely spiffing. Look how clean the text block of that is. Absolutely lovely. Look at that. It's gorgeous. And this is from Collier Books. And this is an old one as well. And I'm just hiding it from you. The paper is so white. This is from 1971. And this is The Cube Root of Uncertainty by Silverberg. What a title. Come on. If you're a science fiction writer, make it odd. Make it difficult. Make it strange. Get that cognitive estrangement going. The Cube Root of Uncertainty. Fantastic. If you're going to get the sense of wonder, if you're going to get the paradigm shift and the conceptual breakthrough, begin with a good title. That's what I say. If you can't come up with an exciting title, you know, let's bring it all back. Let's get weird again. That's what we want. And here's another Silverberg um, collection. Again, this is a Valentine. And this is pretty good, Nick, considering our order is. This is from March 72. And this is the reality trip and other implausibilities. It's sheer poetry. You know, if you're going to write a book, make it sound odd, make it sound interesting, get it standing out. Now, everybody's too afraid to stand out in something like SF, you really should. So look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. So I was really pleased with that as well. So lovely to add three unusual Silverberg collections to my little archive of Bob's work. What a man he is. So on the podium here, we've got various things. And I'll pull them down and show them to you. We may as well go with another Bob. This is Dark Stars. Not an uncommon book. Um, I haven't seen this livery for a while. Again, this is Valentine as well. And let's see, what date is this from? This is um, first US print in 69 and then 71. So this is obviously later than the UK one. Let's see. Um, interesting. And there's all sorts of great stuff in here. Cornbluth, Lafferty. A.K. Jorgensen, mm. Ordis, Harrison, Brenner, Dick, Silverberg, Ellison, Masson, Ballard, Lieber, Blish, Knight, Del Rey, Anderson. A veritable galaxy of stars, my dears. Absolutely fantastic. Lots of the greats in there. New Wavers and traditional as well. Lovely stuff. So very pleased with that. And again, 
no broken spine, no ripples, clean sort of text block, a bit aged, but you know, it is what it is. It's the Outlaw Bookseller Standard, beautiful stuff. This was the book I mentioned earlier on. Oh, I didn't mention it. I just mentioned I started reading an old Lieber on the train. This is Conjure Wife by Fritz Lieber, which is the first Lieber I read. I had this edition. I bought it secondhand in the mid 80s when I first moved to Bath. And really, it's, it's a fantasy novel, a supernatural horror, you could say. It's about a sort of an urbane university college lecturer. And he discovers that his wife is secretly a witch. And then he discovers that all women are secretly witches and it's been filmed twice and I think I think the version I have um, which is a black and white movie from the late 50s I think it's called Night of the Eagle I'll flash it up on the screen and I what I should have done was dug it out but you know if you saw that corner honestly it's just a nightmare so that's Kendra Wife love that title brilliant and this is really really great I just started reading I was instantly transported back the first time I read it really really supple prose sophisticated intelligent and this must have been written in the 40s and let me just see 53 it was published and yeah this is great so i am going to look back at lieber um, maybe that one story just wasn't one that was firing for me so yeah great stuff shackley again citizen in space a collection an uncommon one nel lovely unrippled flat text block good and you know my my partner the video with it, she said to me gosh she said that's in such good nick first published by ballantyne in 55 reprinted 62 and this is the nel edition new english library hodron stone june 1969 look at that that's only six years younger than me this book and it's like new absolutely beautiful not like new it's nearly there it's not as new as the shackley looks it's astonishing absolutely gorgeous so i'm going to pop that there for you to feast your eyes on it's got the old spaceship on the cover we do like that don't we we really do even if the story doesn't have a spaceship in it we like spaceship on the cover okay book i meant to get for a good while now never been able to find a copy in decent nick pierre barbe um Baphomet's meteor alternative history french sf um with crusaders and of course the goat of mendes there as well so a bit of supernatural stuff there um alternate words novel um nice yellow unfaded door spine and great stuff so sort of maybe james blish territory perhaps we'll see but i've always wanted to have a go at that one it's an interesting one i'm moving fast because i can see the batteries running down and the video will be long enough anyway something i never grow to bind despite being a barry n malsberg net is phase four his film tie-in for the wonderful Saul Bass film, which if you've not seen it, it's great. Um, super intelligent ants. And, you know, yeah, the UK one is everywhere. This is an American one, which is much, much nicer. Great stuff. There's a really super Blu-ray of this. It's great. It's got really good close-up photography of ants. And because Saul Bass was basically, he designed um, opening credits of people like Hitchcock. It's the only film he directed. Really good, intelligent SF film. Fantastic stuff. And there was a bit of a wave of those sort of insect or arthropod based horrors in the sort of mid to late 70s. Bug is another one with Bradford Dillman. That's a funny movie. Um, but this is face forward. Great stuff. So, yeah, so that that goes in as part of the Barry Completist pocket books. Unbroken Spine. Gorgeous. Charles Platt, The Silicon Man, which I don't recall ever being published in the UK, 1990s. The text block's in a hell of a state, it has to be said, it's really dirty. I'm going to try and give that a clean. Charles, of course, was a New Worlds contributor, spent a lot of time in the States, and this is in the Bantam Spectra Special Editions. I don't know much about this. I haven't read um, a lot of Charles' later work. I've read all the early stuff again and again later stuff not so much i'm looking forward to that so it's a treat to find that because a lot of the 90s books are much harder to find than ones before um a uncommon book which fetches up to 80 dollars in the usa this one has a few dings on the front of the cover you saw it when nick did a book haul at graham's and this is space relations by donald barr which is a book which developed a bit of a reputation these days it's supposed to be very naughty um I'm going to read it, see what I think. I've always understood it's quite minor. Futura Orbit paperback. So got that as well. Didn't have to pay 80 bucks for it. Not that I would have in the first place. So there you go. Finally, 
I don't know if I've mentioned this before or not. This is a book which is about 20 years old. And this is Paul Cornell, British Summertime. You might know that name. He's been involved in writing Doctor Who novels, what have you. He did some X-Men comics for a while as well. One of the sort of X-Men strands. British Summertime. Great title. I read this when it came out. Didn't think it was front rack. I want to try it again. But... I wanted it. I've been looking for a decent copy. I'd like a hardcover, but it's very uncommon. They're on things like World of Books, where you know they're going to be in a state. And the beauty of this is that this book is set in Bath, and it actually begins literally five minutes walk down the road from me um, in Bath Ford, which is the village where the occupier who does the music on the channel all the time lives. So it opens up there on a, a wet sort of day in Bath. And yeah, it's an interesting book, so I was chuffed to get that A format from the dying days of the A format. So that was the book haul, and I hope you enjoyed that. And there will be more visits to Bob's coming up. And I am hoping to go down one day and not film there and just spend some time sort of shooting, you know, with him and um, and chatting and stuff. He's a great guy, you know. And you you know, send him a send him an, an email. And of course, there's Morris at Zardoz Books. And also Andy at Cold Tenage is worth getting stuff from. Justin L. Moss on eBay. You know, I, I'm hoping to visit a lot more dealers um, over the next year or so. And um, I've, I've had nothing but great experiences with these guys. So anyway, next time you see me, I'll probably have shaved. And what's coming up next? Well, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. But thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Do watch Jules's video. It's brilliant. Do all the subscribe, like, click, super thanks, what have you. And, you know, I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.